الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى اله واصحابه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اقرا باسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الانسان من علق اقرا وربك الاكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الانسان ما لم يعلم وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ادبوا اولادكم على ثلاث خصال حب نبيكم وحب اهل بيته وتلاوه القران فان حملت القران في ظل الله يوم لا ظل الا ظله وقال عليه السلام لان يؤدب الرجل ولده خير له من ان يتصدق بصاع او كما قال عليه الصلاه والسلام صدق الله مولانا العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ما قال ربنا وخالقنا ورازقنا من الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين ان الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا ايها الذين امنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد كما صليت على سيدنا ابراهيم وعلى ال سيدنا ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد كما باركت على سيدنا ابراهيم وعلى ال سيدنا ابراهيم انك حميد respected mothers sisters daughters this program has especially been kept for our ladies may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward maulana ibrahim surti sahab maulana abdullah rawat sahab who organized the program may allah accept their khidmat may allah make their fikr and worry about our children beneficial for us and for them fikr of ummah worry for the ummah is something which is highly rewarding our mashayikh akabir used to worry about the ummah they used to get up at night and cry for the ummah hafiz patel sahab rahmatullahi alayhi used to get up at tahajjud time and he would be crying for the sake of the ummah we also need to have this worry of ummah in our hearts and minds this is what will benefit the ummah and benefit us as well may allah reward my friend ahmed as well for coming here setting up this camera i would have loved to be there uh, sitting among you and uh, giving direct speech however due to some uh, necessities i had to return home and i am uh, from uh, speaking to you addressing you from hlce may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our efforts and be pleased respected ladies we are to talk about madrasa i want to talk a little bit about the history and reality of madrasa the word madrasa is derived from dars and darasa yadrusu darsan means 
to study and darasa yudarrisu tadrisan means to teach madrasa is isme zarf from darasa which means a place of lesson so it is a place where which is purely educational is got nothing to do with any politics or siyasat or anything as some people might would might would like to make it madrasa is purely educational institute and madrasa the history of madrasa goes right back to the time of our beloved prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when nabi kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam is blessed with prophethood he starts the first madrasa in darul arqam ibn abil arqam al arqam ibn abil arqam is one of the those sahaba who were the early, first and foremost earliest embracers of islam he had a large haveli koti house which had gates fence so he invited nabi kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam to bring those who embraced islam in his house and have his majlis there and teach from there so those who would embrace islam would secretly go to the house of al arqam ibn abil arqam and there nabi kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam would teach them quran sharif and salah and taharat and basic masail and that would improve their dini condition rectify their condition they would learn directly from nabi kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam and this continued until hijra al arqam ibn abi al arqam died in makkah mukarrama uh, nabi kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam later on moved to madina sharif and we see in madina sharif there was already a madrasa for the jewish people which they had named baitul midras sayyiduna umar radhiyallahu anhu was once passing by baitul midras and the jews were teaching their torah to their kids sayyiduna umar radhiyallahu anhu sat down to listen to them and they read some beautiful verses of torah which were confirming the nubuwwat of nabi kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam he liked those verses he said to them can i borrow these papers and they agreed he brought those papers and came to the majlis of nabi kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam he was feeling really chuffed and happy thinking nabi kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam will get happy as well so he said ya rasulullah um i was passing by baitul midras and they were teaching their children and this was really nice and look what it says about you it says exactly what quran says regarding you as well and i is so beautiful he started reading from there now nabi kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam did not like this abrupt and hasty behavior of sayyiduna umar radhiyallahu anhu he was blushing his face was turning red in anger Sayyiduna Abu Bakr Siddiq radiyallahu anhu saw that so he elbowed Sayyiduna Umar radiyallahu anhu do you see what's happening and Sayyiduna Umar saw the red face of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam he sat straight and he said radiyna billahi rabban wa bil islam dinan wa bi muhammadin sallallahu alaihi wasallam rasulun wa nabiyya i am sorry ya rasulullah i made mistake i shouldn't have uh, you know hasted in this matter Nabi Kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam a uh, gussa subsided anger uh, and then anger was gone and then he said what are you doing am tahawwikuna antum law kana musa hayyan lama wasi'atu lama wasi'ahu illa ittiba'i laqad ji'tukum biha bayda'a naqiyatan laylaha ka nahariha sawa i have brought this deen islam shari'at to you 
which is as bright and shining as the daylight. And the night and day of the Sharia is equal. And it is very clear and open to everyone. If Musa salam, was alive, he would have no choice but to follow me. And you are bringing that stuff from you, from there. He meant to say that because their book has been distorted a lot, we should not read and go uh, and take our dalils from there. They, they could be right, uh, they could be right, they could be wrong. There could be some truth in there, some false in there. So why should we fall uh, uh, for them and bring that from there? This also teaches us that our aqidah, our iman, regarding our Prophet وسلم, should be very strong. And uh, the one of the first things we need to focus on the upbringing of our children is to correct their aqidah, their belief, their beliefs with regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the existence of Allah, the oneness of Allah, the attributes of Allah, the greatness of Allah, should be instilled into their hearts and minds. The love of Allah should be instilled in them. And the main purpose of madrasa, number one, is these imaniyat and aqaid, correction of aqaid and beliefs. We, we bring them to the madrasa so that after believing in Allah, they believe in Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is our prophet. He is our guide. He is our everything. He is our role model. So we, uh, we create his love into the hearts of our children. We encourage them to recite salawat on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Many young children read salawat every Thursday night. A nine-year-old girl gets to see Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in her dream because she is reading the Rush Sharif so much. Young girls, young boys get ziyarat of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is due to the barakat of salawat. We strengthen their connection with Allah and His Rasul. We teach them the belief in the angels, that malaika, there is a special creation of malaika. And when they come to the madrasa, and they are sitting in the classroom. The malaika are surrounding them. They are showering sakina and bringing rahma onto their hearts. The hadith says it. Majtama'a qawmun fi baytin min buyutillahi ta'ala yatluna kitab Allah wa yatadarasoonahu baynahum illa nazalat alayhim ustakina wa ghashiyatuhum al-rahma wa haffatuhum al-malaika wa dhakarahum allahu fi man indahu. Now, if you ponder over the words majtama'a qawmun, when few people gather in a house of Allah, yatluna kitab Allah, reciting kitab Allah, yatadarasoonahu baynahum, teaching one another. Then, the sakina descends on them, rahmah covers them, and malaika surround them, and Allah talks about them with the angels who are with him and malay a'la. Ponder over the word majtama'a, gather. Now, today, due to the blessing of COVID, or we say, you know, the opposite effects of COVID, re reduction in the blessing, many uh, prefer to teach uh, their kids at home online lessons. And many call someone for tuition or send their kids for tuition half an hour, one hour here and there. Then there is no ishtima in there, no collection, togetherness. This hadith is for majtama'a, ishtima. When children get together and study the Quran Sharif, that is when this happens. Not when they recite individually, they are deprived of this special blessing which is mentioned in this hadith. Malaika surrounding them and bringing Sakina upon their hearts. This explains that we have to teach our kids on site, in a masjid, 
in a madrasa, in a place of learning. And uh, teaching online or tuition is only in emergency and cases and urgent cases where there is no other option. Otherwise, where there is option, where there is a masjid close by, where you are able to reach a madrasa, a masjid, you must take your children to the masjid, madrasa to get the blessing and barakat of this hadith of Mujtama'a Qawmun Fi Bayti Min Buyutillah. So uh, we, we bring our kids over here to teach them our deen, our mazhab, to create within them the love of Allah and His Rasul, the angels, and our belief regarding the angels, and our belief regarding the previous scriptures. That when Sayyiduna Musa alayhi salam was given Torah, Sayyiduna Dawood alayhi salam was given Zabur, Sayyiduna Isa alayhi salam was given Injil, those books were divine scriptures. We believe in them as divine scriptures. And our belief is that other uh, scriptures of other religions are not divine. They are not from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Only these three are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they are mentioned in Quran Sharif. Tawrat, Injil, Zabur, they are all mentioned in Quran Sharif. So uh, we teach them about the books of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and about messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From Adam alayhi salam till Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, 124,000 prophets more or less. So we teach them about these prophets, stories of the prophets and, uh, uh, you know, increase their iman in the messengership and bring into them this sense of realization that messengers should be obeyed. Paygambar ki ita'at or ittiba' zaruri hai. And we have to follow in the footsteps of Anbiya Kiram alayhi musalawatu taslima. We can't do without it. And uh, following in the footsteps of Anbiya Kiram alayhi musalam leads to uh, salvation, najat. We have to believe in what they say and whatever commands they bring from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether we like it or not whether it goes with the norm or against the norm, whether we are singled out, we still have to follow the prophets, alayhimu salawat wa tasliman. So even if we are few in number, we are classed as strangers, that these are strange people. They don't do this, they don't do that. We will tolerate that, but we will not tolerate uh, disobeying the prophets, disrespecting the prophets, or any other matter uh, of that type. So this is what we teach our children with regards to Aqaid. Also we teach them about Jannat, Jahannam. Jannat is the place where lies the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those people who pleased Allah will, will go to the place where Allah's pleasure lies. And those who angered Allah will go to the place where Allah's anger is, and that is Jahannam, where there is wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We teach them about taqdeer, good or bad is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, our children need to be nurtured and taught these basic matters. If we don't provide these facilities for them, who will provide it for them? So uh, this is the aim of madrasa. This is the history of madrasa. And Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made special madrasa for the small children of Sahaba Kiram Ridwanullah alayhi majma'in in Medina Munawwara. He appointed teachers for them. He said these uh, teachers should look after the small children and teach them Quran, Hadith, Masala, Masail. So Alhamdulillah from there madrasas started initiated and we see in the time of sahaba khulafai rashidin tabi'in tabi'i tabi'in in the earlier generations the state used to look after these teachers provide for them look after them but as time passed on and islam progressed some time later 
maybe a few centuries later or even one century later, a few decades later, as things, you know, spread out, there was no one to take care of these teachers. So it was decided that they can be paid their remuneration in the form of wages and they can charge for their teaching so that they also have their families and they can look after their families. So, Ayyumma Salas, other Imam Shafi, Imam Mali, Imam Ahmed Rahmatullah, Ali Majma'i allowed, uh, you know, a taking remuneration for teaching of Quran. But Imam Abu Hanifa, who was of the earlier time, he was of, uh, you know, another research. His research was that you can't take any remuneration for teaching Quran. When these three Aima and Sahibain saw that if we stick to that opinion, then much of Quran will be wasted because uh, teachers will have to go to earn their livelihood. Then who's going to look after the children? So they allowed it, permitted it. In spite of that, there were so many teachers who used to earn their livelihood, daily bread by their other uh, sources like tijara, business or some other ways and they would teach for free. There were others, you know, who would just go around from morning till evening, from dawn till dusk, from Fajr till Isha, going around on their ride, maybe a donkey or a mule, from one neighborhood to another neighborhood, to a third neighborhood, to another neighborhood, and they would be teaching kids throughout the day. Some of them used to teach 3,000 kids in a day, from one area to another area. So this is the importance they gave to teaching uh, small children Mas'ala, Masail, Quran Sharif, and uh, you know uh, education. Also, you know these days we get questions of when to start the teaching and madrasa for small children. Alhamdulillah, in our madaris. Uh, you know, we have uh, uh, facilities for kids to study from as early as the age of five. In our Zakaria Masjid, I believe that girls can start at the age of four and a half and boys maybe at the age of five. So whatever your Masjid or Madrasa accepts, then you should go by that age and uh, start your children from there very early on. In the beginning, they will just come and le learn Alif, Ba, Ta, Tha, basic, you know, knowledge. And then they will start reading Pare, Amma, and then Hafti, and then Quran Sharif. And with Masla Masail, in the beginning, they will just learn the Kalimas, and then basic Duas, and then they will move on to learn the more you know important and we could say the the large uh, duas da'awat and they will memorize many of the surahs by which they can make their salats correct so we have to keep on uh, you know keep them in this process uh, for as long as possible sometimes we see in many cases that Parents feel that my child has done khatam of Quran Sharif. He's achieved the goal. So we must take them out of the madrasa. Sometimes at the age of 12, 13, the kids leave the madrasa. But they have, they have not matured yet. They only took some basic ta'aleem. They need to mature. They need to use, they, they need to keep frequenting the madrasa. They need to be attached to the madrasa. This age between 12 to 18 is a very critical age. Either your child will become good or bad in this age because they're going to the secondary school. They develop friendships and they learn a lot from their friends. So what you need to do is don't just let send them to the school and thinking that they've got their GCSEs and uh, they have to work on their... Of course, they can work on their GCSEs as well. But madrasa is as equally important. You have to keep on sending them to the madrasa. 
You know, one of the benefits I noticed is in madrasa times, sometimes the salah uh, time approaches. So in winter, we get sometimes three salats. I know Asar, Maghrib, Isha, and we all pray collectively. So the small, small children praying salat with Jamaat, they pray three namaz with Jamaat during the madrasa time. This is a huge benefit. They learn a lot from the collective Jamaat namaz. So we have to keep on sending them so they can stay close and attached to the madrasa. Don't take them out at the age of 12, 13. Send them, uh, you know, as much as possible, probably up to the age of 17, 18, 19, 20, even later on as well. And if you can find some facilities for alim class, enroll them in the alim and alima class and uh, give them the encouragement to go and study further. So this was a bit with regards to the age uh, at which we, uh, you know, send our children to the madrasa. Try your best to keep them there for as long as possible from when they start till the later on ages. Also, another point to note is that we need to take our madrasa seriously. Sometimes parents think that madrasa is just like a crash. We can get two hours relief from them, less headache for two hours. And they're not really worried about the education. So what we need to do is to teach our kids that madrasa should be taken seriously. We should take it seriously as well. And, uh, you know, spend good time in uh, behind our kids at home as well. If we need to help them with their homeworks, then at least 20 minutes to half an hour to help them with their homeworks. Don't let them sit with gadgets all the time. 10, 15, 20 minutes of relaxation, entertainment should be sufficient. Other than that, you know, you should have your set time routine and go according to that time and teach them. Also, many times what happens is kids uh, miss days because of um, after school clubs or sport clubs or football practice or these types of things. Now, this, uh, you know, uh, does not have any good effect on the kids. Even they will take madrasa lightly and they will look for excuses to miss madrasas. And we need to tell them that madrasa should be taken seriously. And football clubs and this club and that club, they all, uh, you know, are less important than the madrasa. Madrasa is the most important for them. When they get this understanding, realization, they might get frustrated. They might, you know, go into some tantrums. But you have to do with that. You will have to gently play around it and, uh, you know, uh, take them to madrasa with punctuality. Sometimes you might have to give them extra tuition. Some kids are really bright. They don't need extra tuition. But other kids need some help. So where help is needed, you might have to arrange for some tuition at the end of the, uh, you know, week as well. Also, Alhamdulillah, we should be fortunate that um, our masajid and madaris provide education five days a week in the evening from around about five till seven roughly. This is very important. Some people say we will send our kids for weekend madrasa and they send one day a week Sunday classes. Sunday classes are not enough. The kids don't give it, get into the system of madrasa and learning and Quran Sharif. If you send them for two hours, one day a week on a Sunday, what are they going to learn? And especially when the Ustad has 20 children, 15 children around him and only for two hours once a week, what, what are they going to learn? Where we have five day regular madrasa, we should, you know, provide that the facilities provided, we should utilize that facility. 
I've been to, you know, places. Let's say America. I was once in North America. And uh, uh, I, uh, there was some gathering of ulama i kiram. So I saw one graduate of Darul Umbari. So I asked him, Since when have you been here? He said, Morana Sahib, I came here for Tanavi. And then they liked my tilawat. So they called me over. So Alhamdulillah, I did my visa, everything. And I'm here with my wife. I said, Mashallah, what do you do? He said, Sahib, nothing namaz. I said, what about madrasa in the evening? He said, there's no madrasa. I said, let alone madrasa. You know, the whole time nobody comes. I'm the only one in the masjid. And madrasa time, they just don't want to send the kids to the madrasa. So what about kids' education? He said, I tried madrasa, but nobody would send. So I just teach them, uh, you know, once a week, Sunday. They come for a bit. But even that time, they're messing around. Their mind is in the basketball outside or whatever games. They, they, don't, they hardly learn anything. They hardly read anything. So I said, no, you should work hard. And you are an alim. You are responsible for your community, society. You are responsible for their kids. You have to teach them. You have to sit down, gather all the parents, create in them some urgency and bring their kids to the madrasa five days a week. And uh, he said, Moana Sahib, they won't. So I said, start from twice a week, three days a week, and then increase it, you know, to five days a week. But every day, the, the kids should come to the madrasa. So this is the way madrasas should take place. And, you know, our asatiza as well. If there are asatiza listening, you should be really concerned about your student. That how can I, you know, uh, impart this knowledge and pass it on to my students? Asatiza were really worried about their students. And when this worry comes, then this transfers into the kids as well. They also worry about studying. When they see the fikr of the teacher, then this fikr and worry goes into the students as well. Once, you know, one of our friends came from South Africa, uh, Qadi Abdul Aziz Sahib, and he used to teach his class over there. And he mentioned some re really nice points. One of the points he mentioned was, Marana Sahib, I, I really care for my students. He said that when my students are learning their hifas and they are sitting around me learning, I'm waiting for them to come and read to me, then in my heart of heart, I make dua for them. I make dua that, oh Allah, make their sabak easy for them. Oh Allah, place the Quran in their hearts. Oh Allah, forgive these kids. They are young. They are immature. They might sometimes be reading Quran and other times they, must, they might just be shaking their heads and they might be saying something you know, to their friend who's sitting with them. Sometimes they might swear and abuse as well whilst reading Quran. So their tongue whilst reading Quran has, you know, swearing abuse on their lips as well. So I say to Allah, oh Allah, they are mature. Forgive them for this mistake. Don't deprive them. And he says that, Alhamdulillah, you know, the these duas work. They work hard as well, Alhamdulillah. He said, when exams come, I would pray two rakats salatul hajat. And I would ask Allah to help each and every student pass. And when they get good results, because the examiner comes from outside, external exams. When they get good results, I pray two rakats salatul shukar. That Allah, you help my student to pass and you give them good grades. So this is the worry and fikr of the ustad for the students who are becoming hafiz. So we understand from here that hard work and effort is needed from all sides, from the children's side, from their parents, from their ustad, from the community, from the committee, from the masjid committee, madrasa committee. Everybody should be concerned about our young ones. How can we nurture them? How can we, you know, uh, make them the best of the society? Because our kids are our future. If we build them up well, if we nurture them, then uh, inshallah our deen will prevail and uh, they will survive as well.
So, um, you know, now we move on to this reward of, you know, uh, importance of nurturing our children. First, we remember the Qur'ani ayat, which is in Surah Al-Tahreem, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu ku anbusakum wa ahlikum nara. نَارًا وَقُودُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارَةُ عَلَيْهَا مَلَائِكَةٌ غِلَاظٌ شِدَادٌ لَا يَعْصُونَ اللَّهَ مَا أَمَرَهُمْ وَيَفْعَلُونَ مَا يُؤْمَرُونَ اے ایمان والو بچاؤ اپنے آپ کو اور اپنے فیملی ممبرز کو اس آگ سے جس کے ایندھن اور فیول انسان اور پتھر ہوں گے اس پر ایسے فرشتے ہیں جو سخت طبیعت والے ہیں اور شدید مزاج والے ہیں اللہ کے کسی حکم کو توڑتے نہیں اور جو کچھ ان کو کہا جاتا ہے اس کو کر گزرتے ہیں that oh people who have ایمان save yourselves and your children from the fire the fuel of which are human beings and stones and the guardians and superintendents of that fire are men of very harsh and coarse nature angels of very harsh and coarse nature they don't disobey any instruction which Allah gives them and they carry out whatever they are told now we see over here that this address is for the parents first and foremost and then all those around them that we should all work for our society and save our society and our people from the fire of Jannah. Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not only worried about our people he was worried about other people as well. He was worried about the disbelievers as well. How he can save them from the fire of Jahannam and take them into Jannah as well. And here we are. We are not worried about our children. We don't have that worry and that fikr which is needed. Mufti Shafi Sahib Ramatullahi writes under this ayah that tell me if your baby was crawling towards fire and he was going to put the hand in the fire he was thinking that that red burning coal is something good and it's a red ruby and he was going to hold it and put it in his mouth. You are sitting on your chair or couch. Would you stay seated there and say, baby, don't put your hand in the fire, you will get burnt. Or you will just jump and rush and grab hold of the baby and pull it from the fire. You will show concern. Similarly, when our children are jumping into the fire of Jahannam. We can't just sit there and say, oh, what can I do if he's doing it, she's doing it, I, I can't do it, See, they don't listen to me. No, 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 this attitude is not right. You have to be concerned. You know, if your children are falling into the fire of Jahannam, they are, they are on this social media and websites and YouTube and listening to all stuff here and there, then when you know it, you know, if your if your daughter is not dressing properly, going out there, making friendships, maybe committing zina, nauzubillah, fornication. If your son is nauzubillah, gone into wrong route of maybe drugs and sharab and doing wrong stuff, then you as the parent should be really concerned. You know, you should be really concerned, and your concern will uh, show effects. This is ku and wa alikum nara. Mufti Taqi Sahib Usmani Rahmatullahi was asked by a written, someone wrote to him from Germany that I came here from Pakistan, I'm working over here, but now, you know, I, I'm regretting because my family is all over the place. My wife doesn't listen to me, my kids don't listen to me, they don't pray namaz. When I tell them to pray namaz or something, they just shout at me and they disobey me and run around here and there, I don't know what to do. So Adrat Mufti Sahib wrote back to him, he said, you know, uh, take it easy, be gentle with them. Hazrat Mukti Sahib said, <coughs> don't order them, do this, do that. Just give them some advice, nasihat. And first of all, be 
practical yourself. Pray your namazes properly and pray in front of everyone. They see you praying namaz. Also, read some Quran Sharif in front of them. Read loudly because Quran brings barakat in your home. And also, Hazrat Mufti Sahib wrote that, you know, read the Dua Ibrahimi and the Dua of Surah Al-Furqan after every namaz once. Rabbi ja'alni muqeem as-salati wa min zurriyyati rabbana wa taqabbal dua. Rabbana ghfir li wa li walidayya wa lil mu'mineen yawm yaqoom al-hisab. Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa zurriyyatina qurrata ayun. Waj'alna lil muttaqeen imama. Read these duas after every namaz and do some ta'aleem in your home. Ta'aleem from fazail a'mal, some nice books. Just, just read from there. Whether they sit in that ta'aleem or they don't, once, twice, then slowly, slowly, they'll get connected and they'll feel like sitting in there. And then they will start. So after a few months, he writes back and he says, Hazrat, I practice on your mashwara and alhamdulillah, the condition of my household has improved. My wife has started to pray namaz as well. My kids are also now praying namaz. I don't have to order them. They see me when I, you know, praying namaz. When you go to the masjid, your children will follow you. When the mother prays namaz in the home, the young girl will also say, my mother is praying, I should also pray. So we have to slowly, slowly get them into the system. This is Hu Anfusakum Wa Ahlikum Nara. This is called nurturing, looking after, giving them the proper upbringing. You know, other people might give different name to this, that uh, they are, you know, uh, they won't like it. But, you know, they can behave the way they want. Our deen tells us this is our duty. Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in one hadith, لَأَنْ يُؤَدِّبَ الرَّجُلُ وَلَدَهُ خَيْرٌ لَهُ مِنْ أَنْ يَتَصَدَّقَ بِصَاعِدٍ That training and nurturing and giving good uh, adab, manners, good behavior, good respect, to your child is better than giving one full sa'a of sadaqah to a poor person. So even if you give them a little bit of good advice, train them, teach them one good adam, that is better than giving sadaqah of one sa'a of grains to a poor person. Imagine how much, how many times you will speak to them, talk to them, train them, teach them, you know, use the right, uh, uh, you know, course and way of doing things. In one hadith, Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Addibu awladakum ala thalathi khisal. Train your kids upon three things. Number one, hubbin nabiyyikum. Create within them the love of your Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And wa hubbi ahli baytihi. The love of the family of your Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which includes Ummahatul Mu'mineen, Hazrat Aisha, Hazrat Hafsa, Hazrat Umm Salama, Hazrat Zainab, and which includes the daughters of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hazrat Zainab, Hazrat Ruqiyya, Hazrat Umm Kulthum, Hazrat Fatima Tuz Zahra, Radiyallahu Anhunna Ajma'een, and their husbands and their children. And includes especially Sayyiduna Ali, Sayyiduna Hassan, Sayyiduna Hussein, and their descendants. They are all family of Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It includes the cousins of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and uncles like Sayyiduna Abbas, Sayyiduna Hamza, Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Abbas. So we should talk about our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his beautiful family members and their stories to our children, stories of Hassan, stories of Hussein. And, you know, beautiful stories of their descendants, Imam Zainul Abideen, Imam Muhammad Baqir, Imam Jafar Sadiq. When we talk about them, nice, nice stories to them. Then stories have a real profound effect on our children. So we should talk to them, nurture them in this manner. And the third thing is the three things. Love of your Nabi, love of the family of your Nabi. And the third thing is said, Tilawatul Quran. Train your children to recite Quran Sharif. Daily, on a daily basis, they must recite some Quran Sharif. 
Sometimes kids leave Quran, Masjid, Madrasa at the age of 12, 13, and then they never pick up the Quran for the rest of their lives until they get married and they get children themselves. And then maybe they might start praying and they might realize, yeah, I need to read Quran. So let me brush up. And they come to Imam Sahib, Imam Sahib, I don't know, I forgot how to read Quran, teach me again. This is not the right way to behave. You know, we have to teach them that every day you must read Quran. Hazrat Maulana Abul Hassan Ali Nadwi Rahmatullahi Ali said that my mother was very punctual of two things when she was looking after me. He grew up as a yatim. So his mother brought him up and she looked after him very well. He said she, she was very punctual about two things. You know, main thing important like five daily namaz, salat and everything is there. But apart from that, two things. Number one, I must sit down to recite some Quran after Fajr namaz. Yeah. If, I, if, I, if I miss that tilawat, she would get really angry. Why did you not read Quran this morning? You must have read a little bit of Quran, a few pages every day in the morning. First thing, read Quran Sharif. And number two, she was very concerned about my akhlaq behavior. You know, and this comes out especially with the attendant, the khadim, the khadima in the house. He says that once, you know, I shouted uh, at the khadima and I said something rude to her and my mother overheard me. And she called me over and she said, Ali, what did you say? Is that how you speak to your elders? Even though she's an attendant, she's much senior to you. You can't talk to her like that. You, you must apologize and say sorry to her. So it was really hard. But my mother called the Khadima over and said, Ali, say sorry, apologize. So it was really hard. But Hazrat Mulana says, I had to say sorry and apologize. This brings good akhlaq and good manners in the children. They don't grow up as haughty and proud and screaming, shouting and throwing tantrums to get their way and forcing the parents to bring them what they need and do what they want and have their own ways. You have to nurture them and you know, bring some humility and humbleness in them. Sometimes you have to deprive them of privileges don't give them everything they want. You know, if you give them everything they want, then they've got it all on the plate. They won't learn how to, how to, how to, they won't learn how to, you know, uh, value things, how to value, you know, the things you have. They will just have everything on the plate. So they will behave in that manner. So sometimes you have to say no as well. You have to learn how to say no. And they have to understand when my father, my mother says no to something, then that's it. I'm not getting it no matter what I do. So you have to train them, teach them. You know, we live in this society. We have to learn some good things from them as well. For example, they put their kids to sleep at 8 o'clock in the evening. Now, even if there's a World Cup football match or there, you know, whatever, they will say, no, 8 o'clock bedtime is bedtime. Recording, you can watch the recording over the weekend or later on, but now you have to go to sleep. They have them some principles. The, their life is in discipline. You know, you have to have a disciplined lifestyle. This is why many send their children to grammar schools, because the education might be the same like state schools. But in state schools, there's no discipline. In grammar school, there's proper discipline. And the child is properly disciplined when he goes to the grammar school. You have to go to sleep at this time, wake up this time. You have to do your homework like this. And you want to progress, you have to do this. This is why, you know, there is a good name for Oxford and Cambridge. Because those colleges and universities are more disciplined than others. So to bring this discipline within us, you know, we have to work on ourselves. Five time daily namaz brings great discipline within us. If we are punctual of five daily namaz, ladies at home, we bring our kids to the masjid and, uh, you know, help them to pray five times a day. This brings a huge amount of discipline within them. Their mind will be focused on the salah. Every time salah time comes, they will rush to the masjid. They themselves will walk to the masjid and they themselves will pray namaz properly. 
So this is the aim of our madrasa, our maktab, our teaching that we nurture our children. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying that to nurture your child and to give them nice, good upbringing is better than giving out charities to poor people. And you know, Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam encouraged the education for the girls, not only girls, for the slave girls as well. In the famous hadith of Bukhari, three people will be given double reward. A man from Ahle Kitab who believed in his Prophet and believed in Muhammad وسلم, will get double reward for his Iman. A person who had a slave girl, he brought her up very well. He educated her and educated her very well. He trained her and trained her very well. And then he freed her and then he married her, will get double the reward. And a slave who you who fulfill the haq and the right of his master and haq and right of Allah as well. He used to run around doing khidmat of his owner and he used to pray his namaz on time as well. So in the namaz jama'at, he is standing next to his master, but the master is gain, getting one reward and the slave is getting double reward. So uh, Nabi Karim وسلم, said that even if you have a slave girl, you have to teach her and nurture her, give her proper education. And this is why ladies were given proper education as well. Once Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came, came to his house and there was this lady, Mehman, who was sitting with one of his wives. And he said to her, you know, uh, you know, you taught my wife such and such. So why don't you teach her how to write, you know, nice handwritings as well? So he told that lady to teach her, his wife, how to write with nice handwritings as well. So he liked it, you know, teaching and education. People used to come and ask questions. Nabi Pak Sallallahu would give answers, replies. Hazrat Aisha was highly educated. She was only uh, no, nearly 10 when she came into the house of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She stayed with him for nearly nine years. And with this, in this age of 10 to 19, she learned a lot from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So much that she passed it on to the Ummah. She passed on a, an ocean of knowledge to the Ummah. More than 2,210 hadith, nearly one quarter of ilm is narrated from Aisha anha, who was very young when she came to the house of the Prophet So our deen is all about education, education, education. Give them, you know, I'm not going to focus on the dunya education because people are already giving it. We need to focus on the dini education because many people are neglecting it. They are not concerned as much as they should be about the religious side of education. Whereas religious side education is more important than the secular education because the secular education helps us in this dunya. Dunya education is for dunya. You become a doctor, graduate, engineer, lawyer, barrister, professor, teacher, educator. You get good job, good money. You have a good house, nice car. You live, lead a lavish lifestyle. That's all you get. And this, as soon as you die, then your education will not benefit you in the grave, nor in Maidani Hashar. But this religious education helps you in this dunya. It keeps you on track. It, it, it gives you good name. It gives you izzat, honor. And then it, it, it helps you to practice. And then this knowledge will benefit you when you go down under the grave. You, if you are happy of Quran, if you are alim of deen, if you are practicing your namaz, your sabr, your patience, your tilawat, your walking to the masjid for namaz, it will all come to help you in your grave. And it will help you in maidan e hashar And it will protect you from the azab of Jahannam. And it will take you to Jannatul Firdos. It will help you to elevate your ranks in Jannah. Now see, this religious education is taking you right till the end where the Jannatul Firdos lies. So this is why we say that dini education, the madrasa education is more important than the worldly and secular education. So we should create a balance between the two. And if there is some deficiency on the worldly side, we should be least concerned about it. But there should be no deficiency on the madhabi and religious uh, education side. We have to give them this properly. I will close, conclude over here. If we go back a few, things have really changed now. If you go about three, four decades back, 
we see our elders who came in this country, you know, maybe four or five decades ago, they were really, really concerned about their kids. The first things our elders did was establish masjid, madrasa. Mulan Ali Jamil talked about this, that these Gujis, Gujaratis, wherever they go, you know, they've established madrasas and through madrasas, they've saved the iman of their children. And uh, 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 our, our elders were really worried about our madaris. And we see they were also worried about their, uh, you know, practical side for their children. I remember Mulan Jallat Sahib, you know, he used to go in Tabligh Jawad. But he was really worried about the Fajr namaz of his children. So every day from his Jamaat, you know, there were no mobiles at that time. There were phones in masjids where you have to put in coins to make a call. So in the morning at Fajr time, Hazrat Maulana Jallat Sahib would make a call to his household and remind his wife to wake all the kids up for Fajr Salah. So worried about their Fajr Namaz. I remember our respected Yusuf Qazi Sahib. You know, um, he would wake his children up for Fajr Namaz every day, even if it was summer and Fajr would ask 4.30. So someone said to him that they have to go to school in the morning. You know, why do you wake them up? And other, uh, Yusuf Bai Qazi said, Bai, they can go to school if they want. And if, if they don't want they, whatever they, they want, they will not be questioned on the day of Qiyamah whether they went to the school or not, but they will be questioned whether they prayed Fajr or not. I'm worried, I'm worried about that questioning on the day of judgment. How will they answer? They are balir, they are mature, they are 13, 14 year old. Namaz is farz upon them. If they don't pray, then Allah will question them. I'm worried, I'm worried about that questioning on the day of judgment. So you have to be more worried about your akhirat. You know, about practice, about learning, importance of praying, importance of learning and education. This is why we say these madara, madaris are for our akhirat. They benefit us in dunya and in akhirat. So we have to be really, really concerned about our madrasa, our religious side education, understand it and, uh, you know, uh, give this education to our children make du'as for them that they put into practice whatever they learn. Alhamdulillah, Jazakallah to Nurul Islam Masjid and Musalla Noor, both Noors. Over here is Nurul Islam and there is Musalla Noor. And in both sides there is Mawlana Abdullah, here is Mawlana Ibrahim Sahib and everyone connected to the, them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your efforts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make them worthwhile. May Allah accept your khidmat. May Allah take your musallas and your places of worship from strength to strength. May Allah fulfill and you know help in the completion of uh, Masjid Nurul Islam and also the project which Mawlana Abdullah Sahib was mentioning yesterday about Musalla Nur and extension. May Allah help in that extension as well and accept all your khidmat. May Allah be pleased with you. May Allah provide for you and Jazakallah khair al-jaza to all the ladies who attended the talk, who gave me the opportunity to sit down in front of you and talk about our beautiful deen. May Allah reward you and be pleased with you. We'll make short dua. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa an. Nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk. Allahumma laka alhamdu wa laka al-shukur. Allahumma la nuhsi sanahan alayk. Anta kama athnayt ala nafsik. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Nabi al-Ummiyya. Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi. Wa sallim taslima. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana. Wa fi l-akhirati hasana. Wa khina adhab al-nar. Rabbi ghfir wa alhamu anta khayru al-rahimin. Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa dhuriyatina kurrata a'yun. Waj'al المتقين إماما ربنا هب لنا من الصالحين ربنا هب لنا من لدنك ذرية طيبة إنك سميع الدعاء رب اجعلني مقيم الصلاة من ذريتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء ربنا اغفر لي ولوالدي وللمؤمنين يوم يقوم الحساب رب ارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرا رب ارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرا رب ارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرا
یا رحم الرحیمین محض اپنے فضل و کرم سے ہم سب کی مغفرت فرما دیجئے پوری امت کی مغفرت فرما دیجئے پوری امت پر رحم کر دیجئے کرم کر دیجئے معاف کر دیجئے پروردگار عالم یہ مستورات خواتین اپنے گھروں سے نکل کر یہاں پر آئی ہیں یا اللہ آپ کے دین کی بات سیکھنے کے لیے یا اللہ ان کے آنے کو قبول فرمائیے یا اللہ دیز لیڈیز ہاف کم ٹو لرن ا لٹل بٹ اباؤٹ یور دین ریوارڈ دیم فار ایوری اسٹیپ دے ٹوک فرام دیئر ہومز ٹو دا مسجد او اللہ ایکسپٹ دیئر کمنگ ایکسپٹ دیئر اٹینڈنس او اللہ گیو اس آل دی انڈرسٹینڈنگ اف اور دین دی امپورٹنس اف اور مدرسہ ایجوکیشن دی امپورٹنس اف گیونگ گڈ ایجوکیشن گڈ اپ برنگنگ ٹو اور چلڈرن کیپ اس اینڈ اور چلڈرن سٹیڈ فاسٹ آن دا دین ٹل دا ڈے وی ڈائی کیپ اس سٹیڈ فاسٹ آن صراط مستقیم او اللہ گیو اس دا توفیق ٹو بیہیو پراپرلی ٹو لیڈ اے لائف اف تقوی اینڈ پیئرٹی ٹو ریممبر یو ٹو فیئر یو ٹو کیپ اور سیلز کنیکٹڈ ٹو یو گیو اس دا توفیق ٹو ڈو خدمت اف یور دین ٹو دا بیسٹ اف اور ابلٹیز فلفل آل اور نیڈز بی پلیز وتھ اس گیو اس آل دوز گڈ تھنگز دیٹ وچ یور بلوید پروفیٹ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم آسک فرام یو اینڈ پروٹیکٹ اس فرام آل دوز ایولز ٹرائلز ٹربولیشنز پرابلمز فتناز فرام وچ یور بلوید نبی صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم یوز ٹو سیک یور پروٹیکشن ایکسپٹ اور ہمبل ایفرٹس اینڈ گیو اس توفیق ٹو ڈو مور فرگیو اور شارٹ کمنگز ربنا تقبل منا انك انت السميع العليم وتب علينا يا مولانا انك انت التواب الرحيم وصلى اللهم وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين برحمتك يا ارحم